Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all here. My name is Mark Berry. I'm the president of Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park. Uh, my pleasure to welcome you this evening and to introduce our speaker. I, I see a, a fair number of familiar faces, but certainly some I don't know, and it's great to see both. Uh, want to say just a few words about the Institute for those who might be less familiar with us. We are the nonprofit partner to Acadia National Park here at the Skudik Education and Research Center. And our focus is on advancing ecosystem science and learning for all ages. Uh, we often approach that with an emphasis on citizen science or engaging the public in the scientific process, giving people the opportunity to contribute and learn simultaneously. And we have a great array of programs. I won't talk about all of those. I will say that it's a great pleasure for us to partner with the National Park Service, especially this year during Acadia's centennial celebrations and the centennial for the National Park Service. And people may be less aware that Acadia was founded with science as one of its original purposes. And we see our role as helping the National Park Service fulfill the park's potential as a place for science and as an inspiration for further science and further conservation action uh, in a broader region. We do have a lot of programs coming up in relatively short order. Uh, if you're plugged in enough to have found your way here, hopefully you're plugged in to see those as they come up as well. But rely on our website, which is skudikinstitute.org, uh, our email newsletter, or our social media feeds. A few that I'll mention if I keep them all straight. We have a brown bag talk on June 16th, uh, which is the Wild Seed Project. So that's a noon free presentation in this building. Bring a lunch if you like. And then on June 22nd in the evening, we have a talk here by Dean Goodwin. It's called Climate Change for Beginners. A great deal of our work deals with the consequences of climate change how to address the challenges that climate change poses for the park and the region. And I'm hopeful that uh, Dean's talk will be a great introduction for those that might be new or that want a good overview of the issue. And then on June 24th, we have another brown bag, that's a Friday, and it's a talk on alternative fuel vehicles and transportation, uh, what exists now and what may be coming. And this is not 100% confirmed, but I think it's likely that we will be hosting a live broadcast of the MPBN main calling program about Acadia's centennial that same afternoon, so on June 24th. So you might be able to uh, come for the talk about alternative fuel and stay for the radio program about the centennial. And then June 25th is an exciting day. It's Park Science Day as part of the centennial, Saturday. Over on MDI that afternoon, there'll be a ribbon cutting for the rededication of new exhibits at the Sertamont Nature Center, which are focused on climate change, will be a great place for large mem numbers of the public to learn a little bit about pressing issues. And in addition to the presentations and exhibits that will take place that afternoon, there is an airing of a new series of films about science in Acadia the evening of Saturday, June 25th at all three of Acadia's campgrounds. So here at Scudic Woods, but also at Seawall and Blackwoods, uh, those films will show for the first time and I encourage you to come out and uh, try enjoying a film in our new amphitheater at Scudic Woods. Uh, or if you're on MDI, uh, one of those might be more convenient for you. And then the last one I'll mention, I'm just gonna go to the end of June. Uh, on June 30th, we have uh, Abe Miller-Rushing, who's the Park Science Coordinator, and Becky Cole-Will, who's the Chief of Resource Management, giving a talk here on the history and future of science and resource management in Acadia National Park. So they are the experts and the folks that are very much guiding the process of looking forward for the park, and that's a chance to not only hear their thinking, but to interact with them, pose your questions, and share your ideas. So I hope you may turn out for that. Uh, with that, I wanna turn to tonight's attraction, which is our talk 
obviously behind me, of plants on Maine's offshore islands by Dr. Glenn Middlehauser. Uh, Glenn is the director of the Maine Natural History Observatory just up the road in Gouldsboro and a uh, partner to Skudik Institute in several ways over the years. Uh, really appreciate him being here again tonight. He gave a great talk for us not that long ago about his work with purple sandpipers and harlequin ducks. And we're turning our attention to the plants tonight and I will turn the mic and the floor over to Glenn. Thank you. Thanks. So I've, I've had the, the privilege of spending the last uh, 28 years looking at plants on Maine's offshore islands. And it's, it's tended to be the smaller offshore islands that have, have uh, piqued my attention over the years. And so uh, I hope to fill you in on uh, what I've learned over those you know, close to 30 years of looking at island plants. Um, does anyone recognize this, this island? This is a main island. Anyone? What's that? Uh, no, it's uh, Seal Island off of uh, it's outer Penobscot Bay. It's got a seabird colony on it. It's fairly far offshore. But you can really see in this photo um, how, especially on the offshore islands, uh, the vegetation is really, really affected by uh, the water. You know, you can imagine uh, some storms rolling in in winter and, you know, basically scrubbing over those tall cliffs. And it does happen on this island. So to the, the portion of the coast that I'm going to be talking about is really the eastern half or so from Machias to Rockland with uh, Penobscot Bay, uh, Isla Ho, Vinyl Haven, Mount Desert Island. We're here on Skudik Peninsula. So that's, that's roughly the area that I'll be talking. And I, I actually looked this up. There is no true count of the number of islands on the coast of Maine. It's, it's too hard to define to even start counting. Um, but I, I looked on a GIS map of this section of the coast, and there were 2,500 islands on that map in this section. Uh, so that's not, in, that's not counting anything uh, south of Muscungus Bay. But there's really. You know, if I had to summarize what I've learned in close to 30 years of looking at island plants, um, there's really four things that drive plant distribution on the main coast. And I'm going to start, I'm going to you know, tell you these four things, and I'm going to start from the least important and go to the most important. So starting from the least important, and you guys may be a little bit surprised that I'm calling this least important, is, is what's been described you know, in the literature quite a bit is island biogeography. So it's the size of the island, the distance from the mainland, you know, has, a, has an effect on the main coast on the number of plants that can make it out there. So this is a, a group of islands between Skudik Point, where we are now, and Petitmanan Point there. So this is called the Sally Islands. And this kind of you know, describes, you know, helps to show the diversity of, of island habitats on the coast. So there's some that are connected really close to the mainland, connected by a tidal bar. There's others that are slightly larger and wooded. Uh, this is Sally Island, which is partially wooded. Uh, this is Eastern Island, which doesn't have any trees. And then you get to, oh, actually, that one's Eastern Island. Then you get to some of these ledges. And the, the last two, or uh, possibly three, don't have any plants on them at all. Uh, they're just, they're, they're too low and get scrubbed by the water. 
Okay, so that's the, the first driver of plant distribution on the main coast. The second, slightly more important, is the history of human occupation on these islands. So this is Matinicus Rock with a lighthouse that was put out there in the 1800s sometime, I believe, uh, with a long history of people out there building things, living out there with, you know, families, you know. And that's, that's a really important driver of the plants I see there now on an island. But a slightly more important factor is the grazing history on the island. Um, and most of the islands had sheep on them in the past. A lot of them were taken off. I think the you know, most were off by the 60s, but you look back the early 1900s and there was sheep on a lot of islands uh, because water makes a good fence. You can, you can put your sheep on a little island and know right where they are. And if it's small enough, you can get out there and you know, see how they're doing really quickly. And so now you must be wondering what I'm going to describe as the most important thing driving plant distribution on the coast. And it might surprise you, but it's, it's the currents. And I'll, I'll explain this a little more, a little more in depth. So this is the Gulf of Maine. So Cape Cod down here, the Bay of Fundy, Nova Scotia. So there's a cold water current, the Nova Scotia current, that actually originates up on the Labrador coast that comes down. And it gets deflected into the Gulf of Maine um, on the, the eastern side. And then it gets mixed up in this Bay of Fundy with uh, really extreme tides in the Bay of Fundy. And that stirs up all this cold water, so it brings uh, the colder bottom water to the surface with the big tides. And then Grand Manan, which is that island there, has a little bit of a shelf on it as well, which it's, you know, what we're, what this current is doing is getting mixed up in here, but it's driving a, a cold water current southwest down the main coast. Um, and so as that cold water gets mixed up in here and starts driving down the coast, uh, the, the underwater topography brings it to the surface around Grand Manan. Uh, so this is a, a very cold water coast. It starts dissipating pretty quickly, the water temperatures. Uh, by Scudic Point, it's starting to, uh, to get warmer. By the time it has to go around Cranberry Islands and Isla Ho, some of those islands, it really starts losing its umph. And then with Penobscot Bay, it kind of just disintegrates. And so that's one of the more important drivers of plant distribution on the main coast. And one thing about these cold water currents is in the summer, when you have warm air masses coming over and they hit this cold water current, the air temperature drops. You know, warm air can hold a lot of moisture. You lower the temperature and the moisture needs to precipitate out, which is the result of fog. Um, so not only does this cold water current cool the temperatures somewhat, uh, but also on the hottest days in summer, you're likely to encounter really thick fog on the island. So I've enjoyed many uh, a wonderful day in the field in a sweater working all day in thick fog. And it's, I come back to the mainland and everyone says, oh, what a scorcher, it was 90. Um, but it's not the case on these easternmost islands, at which is a big boon for plants. They don't, you know, they're eliminating one of the stressors, a couple of the stressors, which is heat and moisture on those hottest days. There's a lot of fog uh, 
uh, collecting on the leaves and soaking the soil. So now I'll describe a little bit about what kind of research I've done on these islands. Um, and I've had skiffs for a number of years to get out among these islands. I've had a couple different dories or dinghies. I currently use an inflatable going ashore. I used to use a double-ended dory. Uh, recently switched to a, a working sailboat. This is a 19-foot um, open boat, open sailboat. Uh, that I'm hoping to fit with an electric motor here at some point to help lessen our carbon footprint uh, with our research on the islands. But this is our latest uh, research vessel for getting out around among the islands. So when I land on an island, uh, basically my goal is to wander through all the habitats. It takes about um, for a 10 to 15 acre island. It's a solid day, you know, eight, 10 hours or so, wandering around and making notes of the plants that I see. But it's, it's not enough to make one trip. You really need to make a trip a month from June through September. Because in June, you've got the spring flowering plants that come up. And they're really showy and easy to see. By August or September, they're really hard to find. And the same with the fall flowering plants is they're not noticeable. Even in July sometimes, you don't pick them up. By the September trip, they're, they're all visible. So I make multiple trips and do this same inventory covering the entire island on each trip. And I used to you know, not subdivide the island at all during my inventory efforts, but recently decided that um, it made sense to grid the island uh, when I was doing my inventory work. And so these grids are 30 meters on a side, that's about 90 feet or so. And as I, now I can walk, so I put this grid on my GPS, my handheld GPS, so it's a virtual grid, I don't mark it on the island. I just walk around with my GPS. And you know, if I'm walking in that square, um, I make a list of all the plants in that square. And then I list the abundances, the categorical abundances of each of the species on each trip. And so I'm, what I'm, my goal is to get the maximum abundance category of all the plants uh, on that island in that particular year. And at the end of the year, you can generate nice distribution maps of, of each species on the island. So this is a, an island I did, Crow Island. It's off of Rockland last year. And this is a distribution map for Canada thistle, which is an invasive plant. And it's, you know, I might have in the past said this was an uncommon or a rare plant on this island. But now that I've I do my inventories in these grids. You know, we know exactly where it was in 2015. It was occasional in those three squares. It was uncommon in those, and it was rare in those. It was not found anywhere else on the island. So that's a, that's a lot of info that's being archived now as part of the inventory effort uh, that can get repeated in 50 or 100 years to see what's changed plant distribution-wise. The other thing I like to do when I'm out on the islands is take a lot of photographs of the plants I encounter in all stages of development. So not just pretty flower pictures, but what they look like in fruit. What do the leaves look like? What are the important characters? You know, a photo of an important character that's useful for identification. And I, I put together. Um, Recently, I've been putting together island-specific field guides at the end of the year. Um, but it's, it doesn't quite have the draw. You know, it's, you know, so this guide is for Sally Island, which is uh, east of here a little bit. 
And it's a field guide to all the plants with photos of all the plants as well. Um, but it's not, you know, unless you're going to that island, it's not really that helpful. Um, so it's helpful for the managers working on, on that island. This is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service island. Uh, but beyond that, it's not really helpful to the public. But we are just starting to work on a plants, a wildflowers of coastal Washington County um, that I'm hoping to have ready by sometime next year. Uh, considering expanding that to cover the whole coast before we publish. Um, I'm not sure. We want to see how well the, the Washington County Guide turns out. So I'll, I'll go through some of the, uh, the very common plants that you're going to find if you uh, traipse around on an island on the coast of Maine. And one of the early misconceptions a lot of people have, especially if they haven't traipsed around on these islands, is they look at an island like this and they go, oh, wow, such short veg. It looks like you can walk around all over the place. That, that veg is actually, this is Egg Rock in Frenchman's Bay. It's shoulder high. Um, it's, it's wading through. It isn't, you know, it isn't knee high or shorter. It's pretty thick. So if the, if the island has any spruce trees on it, they're likely going to be white spruce. Uh, if it's a larger island, uh, it can be red spruce. Um, white spruce is very salt tolerant. And the way to tell these two apart, I've only shown white spruce here in the, the photos. Uh, but this is the, the underside of a branch. And so if you look at the, the twig, uh, of that branch. It's fairly smooth. There aren't any hairs. If you look at a red spruce and you turn over a branch, you'll see a lot of hairs that are really quite visible. Um, that's the way to tell those two apart. There's a, two non, a non-native and a native chickweed. The field chickweed on the right is the native plant. There's a non-native um, mouse ear chickweed on the left there. Um, and the non-native is, is more common. The native plant is, is uncommon, really. The way to tell these two apart is if you look at the, uh, the petals in relation to the sepals. Those are the, uh, the green bracts under the petals. And this plant on the left, the non-native one, they're roughly the same length. And on the native variety, the petals are much longer than the sepals. Uh, a couple other common plants are seaside angelica and scotch lovage. Uh, they're both fairly common. They're in the Apiaceae family. Uh, and one characteristic of that family is the flowers are on, the flower clusters are on stalks, but they're all radiating from one point. This family used to be called the umbelliferaceae, kind of like an umbrella. Um, and that's, that's that umbrella character in this, in this family. Uh, the way you tell these two species apart, Scotch lovage, especially towards the base of the stem, it's really quite dark red. But if you look further up, even up higher on the stem, you can see some dark red on the seaside angelica, which can look quite similar. Uh, you might see some pink, but you don't see that dark red anywhere, uh, but especially down at the very base of the stem. It's just, it just doesn't have that dark red quality to it. And these are the leaves of those two species as well. There's some subtle differences in the leaves. The scotch lovage here on the right uh, the leaves are quite glossy, um, and the seaside angelica, it's a, it's a darker green, but it's also, it doesn't have that glossy quality to it. Seaside plantain is, is fairly common on the islands. 
This is actually an edible species. It's harvested over in Europe. Um, it's really tasty. It, it hasn't caught on on this coast. <laughs> you know, there, I think on the islands, there's populations that could get harvested. There's quite a bit of it. You know, on the mainland, I don't see as much. Um, but you can just break off a leaf and munch on it, put it in a salad, uh, cook it up with some rice. It's all really good, very tasty. And sea rocket is a, a common plant. It's in the mustard family. Uh, a fairly pretty light purple flower on it with these, these uh, fairly globose seeds to it. And those seeds float. Um, that's how it gets around from island to island. Um, and this is an edible plant as well. It's, it can be a, a bit peppery tasting, but it, you know, mustard family, there's a lot of peppery uh, flavors in that family. So now some slightly less common species, all, you know, plants occasionally encountered on main islands. Uh, there's two species of iris, of blue flags. Uh, this one on the right is, is more of an arctic plant. The one on the left is fairly widespread in, on the entire coast. So this arctic one, it's keying in on that cold water coast. I only find it on the eastern islands. And probably right around here is where it starts dissipating. Little Moose Island has a nice population of that plant out on it. But that's right where things start cutting off and you don't, by the time you get west of Penobscot Bay, you don't really see that plant anymore. And the way to tell these two apart is the flower is made up of, of six tepals, or what they're called. Basically, it's three petals, petal-like things. So that's these big guys. And then these three other smaller things. So they're fairly small in the Arctic blue flag. And they're fairly big in the common iris. So that's, that's the best character to identify those two species if they're in flower. And one of my favorites is uh, bird's eye. It's in the Caryophyllaceae family. Uh, occasionally forms dense patches along the shoreline. But I think what it really likes is it doesn't like competition with other plants, but it can tolerate a lot of stress. And so if, if you've, this photo was on the very edge of the vegetation, there was some eroded uh, soil. And it was, you know, a big patch of it growing right there. And it's, it's fairly small stuff. It's, uh, you know, an inch or two tall or so. It's not very showy. That's, you know, it's in full flower now. <laughs> but it, it also grows in cities, um, in cracks in the sidewalk. I was in Portland, Oregon uh, a couple weeks ago and saw it growing in cracks in the sidewalk there. Same with Hannaford and Ellsworth. As you walk through the parking lot, you can see this plant growing up in cracks in the pavement. So it gets around, but it, it does like islands too. And Shepherd's Purse, uh, it's occasionally encountered on, on the islands. It's in the mustard family. So characteristic of the mustard family is it has four petals. Um, and then a seed pod that can either be short and squat or can be fairly long and thin. Now a couple of other noteworthy plants to talk about, less common ones. One of my favorite is rose root, or rose root stone crop. It's another name for it, Rhodiola rosea. Um, again, it's an Arctic plant. Uh, suggesting it's really only found, you know, tied to that cold water current on the eastern coast. Um, and there's actually a long history of medicinal use of uh, rose root, uh, dating back to the Vikings. It, there's a long list of things that the root of this plant, when ground up, can do. It, 
it enhances endurance, it enhances memory. Um, and I think more research has been done uh, by the Soviets on this species in terms of its medicinal qualities. Um, and over here, it's, you don't hear of anybody using it on, in North America, really. But it's, it's, I think the plant is more common, but it's also, uh, its medicinal values are more valued in Europe than uh, Russia. And bird's eye primrose is, is a pretty one. You know, again, it's, this is another Arctic plant, so it's, it's found most common on the easternmost coast, uh, tied to that current. And that, you know, that flowering stalk, you know, there's its leaves, a long stalk with a flower at top. So it's fairly big, it's a foot, foot and a half tall. Um, occasionally you can find big patches of it, uh, especially around lighthouses. I think it's, it's tied into the, the lime leaching out of the cement. And moonwort is a rare plant, but it's, so it's a, it's a spore producing plant, so it's related to ferns. It's a small little thing with a couple of leaves and a couple of spores on the top. Um, but an interesting, you know, so there's two occurrences known, or two or three occurrences known of this species in Maine. They're out on the islands. And it's interesting to learn that this is the, one of the more widely distributed moonworts in the world. So it, it gets around, it's in South America, um, North America, Europe, I don't know if it goes into Africa. But the other thing, probably why it's so rare, is it doesn't come up every year. And it's, it's so small, too, you've got to crawl through grass to find it. So it, it may be more common than we've ever found. Um, but that's an interesting island plant. And the eyebrights, there's, there's actually four species of eyebrights on the coast. These are the two that you're most likely to encounter. So on the left is Euphrasia nemorosa. That's, that's the common eyebright. It's a big flower, bigger than the leaves. Uh, and it, white petals with purple lines. And then there's Rand's eye bright, and there's another species of eye bright uh, with much smaller flowers. And if you look at the sides of the petals, you know, they can be quite dark purple as well. So the inside of the flower might look the same as that, but really the outside uh, looks quite different. And that can be, especially on the eastern coast, that uh, Euphrasia randii, the rand's eye bright, can be really common on the shoreline. So on some islands I've seen it, it's just a dense band about three, four feet thick. It just about covers the entire island. So in thinking about how these plants got there, um, there's a number of, number of pathways. You know, probably the first one to consider is that this wasn't an island all the time since the last ice age. And a lot of these islands, not all the islands on the coast of Maine, but a lot of them were connected to the mainland. And so this was the same as that. Um, and so it's, it's the plants got out there just, you know, luck of the draw. It got isolated and made it work. So that's, that's one pathway for plants. There was an interesting study done looking at, at plant colonization on newly formed islands. And they found that the plants that were coming in, roughly 9%, uh, came from, from the water, um, and 16% yeah, 
you know, were blown in on the wind, and 75% were brought on by birds. And I think for the main coast, I would, I would expand that so it isn't just birds, but animals, and I'd include humans in that as well. But that's, that's probably uh, describes change in plants over time on islands as well. You know, the change is fairly slow with, with new species colonizing islands. So plants coming by sea, a lot of stuff floats up on islands. Even stuff that sinks, like lobster traps, float up on islands. They get pushed ashore. Um, and so plants can do the same, you know, can follow that route too. So here's a, a log with plants growing out of it. It's probably got a bunch of seeds, you know, tucked in all the crannies. And so if a storm took that log off to sea and dumped it on another island, it'll bring a whole suite of plants with it. So I've seen this on some inventories I've done where I inventory a whole island and there's this one piece of driftwood that's got two or three species not on the island, but it's on that piece of driftwood. Uh, that's a, a definite pathway. Also by water, uh, seeds can float like uh, scotch lovage. Uh, the seeds float in seawater and remain viable after immersion for a year in seawater. Um, so they can cover a lot of ground in a year. Uh, same with sea rocket, uh, the seeds float. So this plant, you know, it's, it's found on most islands on the coast and it's right on the shore on the highest tides, it's the plant's probably underwater or close to it. Um, and it's, it's really adapted to getting around with its floating seeds. And beach pea as well, um, seeds float. It's, it's fairly common on the islands, you know, so a big storm comes and takes off some seed pods, they wash up on another island. But it's not just seeds. This is a uh, sea beach sandwort. So that plant is probably approaching a foot tall, maybe a little bit more. The stems are really thick, but they're brittle. And it grows low on the shoreline. So a storm comes and it can break off a stem. The stem floats up on another island and can root and start another population. So transport by wind, plants take advantage of that as well. With the dandelion we're all familiar with, the seed is that, that brown bit right in the center there. And each seed has got a long stalk with a big foof, plumy thing at the very tip. You know, it's a parachute. And they can go long distances um, that way. And there's a bunch of species uh, that would get transported by wind. There was an interesting study done in British Columbia a few years ago looking at uh, the plume size of the seeds of plants on small islands. And when you think about it, it makes sense. If if you're a, a plant with wind dispersed seeds on a small island, maybe that's not a good plan. That's, you know, that it's windy a lot and all your seeds just gonna go blown off the island and your population's extirpated from the island. So they found that on small islands, they measured the, the plume length and found that they were shorter on these island populations than on the mainland population. So it's a little micro evolution thing that's, that's happening to, you know, make island living possible for some of these wind dispersed species. Uh, fireweeds and other wind dispersed species. So the, the seed pod is here behind the flower still developing when that fully develops, it splits open, and each seed has a, a, a big plume attached as well. 
But birds transport stuff around as well. You know, gulls, they, they move vegetation to uh, build nests. They're often taking it from right around the nest. But it means they're, they're gardeners, and they're getting right in it, in the thick of it. And seeds can get lodged in their feathers as well. So, and same with cormorants. I think cormorants carry nesting material a little bit further. Uh, sometimes it's seaweed they're carrying around. Other times it's vegetation, island vegetation. And I've seen them flying further with it. And there was an island off of Eastport I was on just last year with an invasive plant. It's Japanese knotweed, actually. And I think what happened, it was right in the cormorant colony. And I think a cormorant brought in a Japanese knotweed stem to build the nest. And it rooted. And within two years, it took over the colony. So the cormorants couldn't nest in that particular place anymore. It's, we were working on knocking it back and eradicating it from the island before it got too out of hand. And there, you know, bird dung can be, you know, you think of it as a fertilizer, but there can be too much of a good thing, especially with cormorants. When you're in a cormorant colony, um, their guano just scorches every plant just about. So nothing can grow in a cormorant colony. They actually prefer nesting in spruce trees, but their guano kills trees. And so they start out nesting in the trees, and after a bunch of years, they're on the ground because the trees don't exist anymore. Um, but there are some plants that can tolerate it, um, like the common chickweed. Um, so it's a bird dung loving plant. And there are a couple of others as well. During fall migration, there's a lot of songbirds that uh, fly through Maine um, from points much further north, nesting grounds. Uh, a lot end up on the islands, so some of the frugiferous birds that eat fruit along the way, um, like red elderberry. So they might eat these seeds on the mainland and end up on an island and poop out the seed along with a little fertilizer packet. Um, and so that's, that's a definite pathway for plants getting to islands. Uh, the black crowberry is thought to be bird dispersed. I'm not sure I've seen a whole lot of birds eating crowberry. I don't know. Um, large cranberry, um, thought to be bird dispersed. Uh, there can be really large carpets of, of cranberries out on the islands. Some of the islands, especially down east, um, make, have really good raking for cranberries. And uh, once again, the, the human history of islands has a lot to do with bringing plants onto an island. So as soon as you start bringing stuff onto an island to build a little shack or a fire pit, or maybe you bring some firewood, or even tools. I've seen signs go up on islands, but you know the shovels and things that they brought out to the island to put the sign up wasn't cleaned of, of stuff. And so I've neat, seen new species just right around the sign. Um, so as soon as you start transporting things from island to island, plants have hitch a ride. And I'm sure I've introduced plants as well on islands. There's, uh, uh, there's beggar's tick seeds and burdock seeds that you can get covered with doing field work. And I pick them all off, but the seeds can be tiny and tenacious especially with burdock. And you know, even a week later, as I'm crawling through a thicket on another island, you know, one of the seeds I missed could fall off. And I've added a new species to the island. So now that we've, we've 
talked a bit about uh, plant vegetation. You know, the, one of the questions that I, I started with was this, are all the, you know, the islands more or less the same vegetatively? Or I just needed to go out on a couple of islands and figure out the pattern, and, and then I get it. But that's really far from the case. Um, and I, I think it's because all these factors, you know, remembering back to those four factors at the start, there's a lot of factors going into what plants are on an island. So in looking at these five islands here that are centered around Scudic Point, roughly where we are, so Egg Rock, Eastern Island, Petit Manan Island, Jordan's Delight, Inner Sand. So I'll talk a little bit about the plants on these islands. And I'm going to order them, those five islands, from uh, the percentage. Uh, I'll start with the islands with the largest percentage of, percentage of native species. And you know, they'll get less native and more non-native dominant as I go. So Inner Sand Island, it's off of uh, addison Jonesport area. Uh, 18 acres. It's uh, Partially forested, partially open field. And one thing about this island is it's tricky to land on. And I think it's especially tricky if you wanted to put sheep out there, they'd be tough to land and they'd be tough to get out. You needed the right day um, to do that. And I think that factor is meant this island probably has never had sheep on it. And it's not the easiest island to land on, so it probably didn't have a fishing shack of a fishermen out there as well. Um, and it's quite diverse, 127 species of plants, 18% uh, non-native plants. That's fairly low for the coast. Eastern Island, that's that low island in the Sally Islands group without any trees on it. This probably had a fishing shack on it. Uh, it likely had a fishing shack on it and definitely had grazing sheep on it over the years. Um, we're already up to 34% non-native. It's only three acres, it's a small island, 58 plants. I think a fair bit of human occupation on that island. Petit Manan Island is it's a seabird island. It's got a lot of terns, laughing gulls, puffins uh, nesting on it. Uh, 11 acres, it's about three miles offshore. Um, lots of human history with the, tied with the lighthouse. There, there was a couple of families tending the lighthouse at some point, and they had cows out there and sheep probably as well. Uh, 35% non-natives, 98 species of plants out on the island. Jordan's Delight, it's one of the larger islands, 27 acres, it's about three miles offshore. A fair bit of human history on the island. Um, it's got some cliffs on one side, but it has some nice landing beaches on the other. Uh, 122 species of native plants. We're, you know, you notice our percent non-natives are creeping up. We're all almost up to 40% now of all the plants in the island are, are non-native. And the last in this series is Egg Rock in Frenchman Bay. Uh, 13 acres, um, 56 species of plants. It's not a whole lot. Uh, 43% non-native plants on that island. But, you know, uh, a long history of occupation. It's a really large gull colony out on the island. And in thinking about this, I, I've, I've come to the conclusion that People don't like to see change in their lifetime. And I don't think we're unique to this concept. 
and change is really, it's natural. And it's something that, that we have a hard time with uh, watching it. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of change that's, that's talked about uh, that's happening. So this is just a couple of days ago and uh, showing water, sea surface temperature water for the Gulf of Maine. Uh, the purple is colder temperatures and you can see that current coming in, uh, getting mixed up and then dissipating by uh, Penobscot Bay. It's been said that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than just about any other gulf in the world, body of water in the world. Um, and that may be true, but it's, the Gulf of Maine is really quite complex in that it's, it's got a cold water source coming in. It's got the, the warm Gulf Stream not too far away. It's got George's Bank that's trying to keep everything separate. And so it, there's a lot of dynamics happening in a small space that's affecting water temperature. And so I, I think it, it's hard to differentiate this warming that we're seeing now if it's, uh, if it's just a, a, a pattern uh, that has happened in the Gulf of Maine over the years or if it's, you know, if it is indeed an upward spiral. And, you know, I think it'll be evident in another 10 years. We're certainly on an upward spiral currently, and we'll have to see, you know, particularly in the Gulf, where there's a lot of complex factors affecting the temperature as to what's gonna play out. But in terms of the plants, you know, yeah, that, you know, things may be warming in the Gulf. Uh, we may, you know, that, uh, that cold water current coming down from Labrador, you know, maybe that'll get less strong over time. So what are the plants gonna do? And I like to think of the plants as really being quite resilient to, to change. Uh, they've put up with it for, you know, it's, in a sense, it's, it's, uh, that's what nature is. It's, it's not, in our lifetime, it seems kind of static and non-changing, but really nature changes quite a bit and uh, the plants and animals are adapted to dealing with that. Um, and that's not to say there aren't gonna be extinctions. You know, there's, we're gonna lose plants in the coast. We're gonna open up new opportunities for new plants going to be a lot of change and the change is going to be hard to watch for some of them you know my favorite plants if they get extirpated from the coast of Maine I'll be sad to see them go but I you know plants are pretty resilient to, to hanging in there um, they don't give up easy <laughs> so I have I have high hopes for them so what does the future hold? What am I gonna do for the next 30 years or 20 years or however many I have on the islands? And I think what I'm after, and I'm just starting this this year, is developing a, a protocol to, to more permanently monitor the plants on the islands. So setting up more plots, not just the big grids where I'm doing categorical abundance, but try to get some baseline data in permanently marked plots on the islands, combined with soil, uh, soil chemistry, and a couple of other abiotic factors um, to really get a good imprint of what the coast of Maine is like on these islands now. And I'm, I'm looking ahead to the biologist 50 years from now or 100 years from now. I'm trying to figure out what kind of information they might want. But the, it's hard to do because it seems that every 10 years there's a, you know, a new idea or we figured something else out. There's something new to study and that happens every 10 years. 
So 50 years from now, it's really hard to say what the important bits are that they wish we would have collected. But you know, we're giving it a shot, see if we can collect something that might be useful down the road. It, so a photo like this with the iceberg and a puffin in it is probably not going to be possible for quite some time in the Gulf of Maine. Um, but this was taken up on the Labrador coast uh, a few years ago. Um, and that's everything, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions anyone has. And we encourage you to raise a hand, and I'll run a microphone to you so that everyone can hear your question. You mentioned some change in nomenclature. Uh, when did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> it's constantly happening. Though, you know, that's again, that's that change thing. We don't like change. And uh, so I've. At first, I was reluctant to some of my favorite names. You know, Cornus canadensis, which is bunchberry, is now changed to Camiperi climenum canadense, which is a tongue twister. Um, but I see it as a way to keep, help keep my aging mind more active of having to, OK, there's a couple names this year. I got to relearn the new ones and the old ones and how they connect. And, so it's, it's really the result of uh, a lot of genetics work worldwide in figuring out populations. You know, the plant that we call something here in North America, is it the same species or is it a variety of the plant in Europe? And with genetics, it's getting easier to figure some of that stuff out. So there is a lot of change happening due to genetics. Glenn, you talk about invasive plants, and it would seem from your um, presentation that um, invasives have been around for a, a lot longer than the, the sort of media would have us believe um, with these invasive. Could you put a little perspective on um, should we be worrying about invasives? Does that really matter? Is there a difference between the terrestrial invasives that the park, for instance, worries about versus uh, what you just shared with us? Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's, it's hard to answer. Um, you know, in a sense, I am working on some invasive plant projects on the islands. The, the populations tend to be small and easily controllable. And I think putting the focus on some of the worst invasives that can really choke out a whole area and wipe it clean of just about all of its native plants, that seems like a no-brainer to put effort along that line. But it does seem like uh, it's a battle you can't win. And, and eventually, you've got to accept the change, I think, that's, that's happening. And I'm not to that point yet with invasive plants, but it's, you know, I, I talk about change and even the percent of non-natives that, that aren't invasive. You know, at what point has our flora changed and we accept those as being part of the main flora? It's tough questions. bit off subject, but what is your favorite bug repellent? <laughs> uh, a bug net, for the most part. Although, uh, I've had Lyme disease, chronic Lyme disease, and so I'm most worried about ticks these days, and so I have a set of field clothes that I spray with permethrin, um, which is a tick repellent. Um, and for the most part, I've, I live in a fairly buggy swamp, 
And so bug densities tend that bug some people, you know, they're hardly noticeable to me. But in thick areas, I tend to break out the, the head net, or actually the whole uh, bug jacket. Um, and it's, it's the rare time that I'll spray some insecticide. But for the most part, uh, the islands are bug free. Uh, and lack of water. But there are some notable exceptions. Uh, like Cross Island off of Cutler. It's a larger island. It's got some wetlands on it. It's some of the highest bug densities I've ever been on. On the coast, on, in Maine, really, have been on that island. They're just thick out there. But that's, that's unusual. Most, most of the, especially the smaller islands, are pretty much bug free. I don't know, <laughs> but that I've that I've done floras of it's it's I haven't counted in a while. It must be seventy five ish. I don't think it's quite up to a hundred yet. Um, but yeah, too many to count really. <laughs> well, maybe we'll. Oh, I'm going to uh, take two more. We had a lull, but we'll take them. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn, for your talk. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on how perhaps these islands have changed since they had more intensive human uh, habitation in, in the past. You mentioned the, the fishing shacks and, and sheep and all. Do you think that the vegetation has really changed after the sheep were pulled off the islands and... and less people were, were using them? Yeah, very much so. But I, it, that part of the puzzle took me the longest to figure out. And I was on an island that, it was Matinic Island, that's had sheep on it continuously for 300 years. They've never been pulled off. And the island is big enough where they never brought on hay to help the sheep you know, last through. And that was actually one of the most botanically diverse islands I've ever been on. And I, and so I, I do think that sheep grazing is really good in terms of island plants. It keeps the vegetation low. Um, it opens up habitat. Uh, it keeps the invasive grasses or even the native grasses low and shorn, which offers more habitat to uh, other plants as well. Oh yes. So, so yes, there was the the grazing question that I wanted to hit on. Uh, but you know, going back further is is what was the the plant like, the plant life like, you know, before, and there really is no answer to that. Um, and I was helping out with a project at University of Maine, so do some uh, cores in small, wet, shallow wetlands on these small islands to, you know, specifically to answer that question. You know, I've got a good handle on what the vegetation's like now. And by looking at, at pollen in cores on these small islands, not on the larger islands that are different, but the smaller islands, you could get a, a better handle on what that early vegetation was like. And there really isn't the historic data to piece that together on, on really what it was like. Even in terms of hardwood, you know, was it prim primarily hardwood? Was it primarily softwood? Were they just open fields? Um, even basic questions like that, I don't think have been adequately answered. A lot of the, uh, the work looking at pollen and peat cores have been on the larger islands. Um, and, and those you know, aren't representative of most of the islands on the coast. Yeah, I was wondering about how many islands were left 
with the sheep on them because we were up in uh, by Halifax and Forster Island there. We were sheep all over the place on a couple islands there. They had some still grazing them. That was only like a year or two ago. Yeah, there's not many. You know, the, the refuge brought some out to the brothers a few years ago, although those are off now. That's off of Jonesport area. Um, there's some on Nash in, I think, Flat Island. Again, that's the Addison area of the coast. Uh, there's been some down at Ilaho, off York Island. But, but really, it's, you know, to get an idea, you know, the number of islands where sheep are currently is really quite small compared to what it used to be. Uh, but getting at the question of, of where were sheep historically is a really tough one to figure out. Um, and that there isn't a, a paper trail of where sheep were on the island. Uh, there is a, a mold that uh, that's associated with grazing animals that could be found in soil samples. And so as part of that island coring project that we were thinking of starting up, that we're, we've been looking for funding for that for quite a while and not found it. But there is a test where you could look for grazers as well in the soil profiles and get a better understanding of where, you know, exactly how many islands were grazed which ones. I think it's been most, but it would be nice to have a, a more definitive test. Glenn, thank you again. And I heard from some of our guests tonight that the snacks outside are pretty good. So I encourage folks to, to move in that direction after we give another round of applause. But I also wanted to... Share a small token of appreciation because it can be cold on islands even on a summer day. So a, a Scudic Institute hat for you. Oh, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.